So our first speaker today is Dr. Uchenna Osai. Um, so she is an assistant professor at the University of Texas um, Dell Medical Center Medical School for Department of Women's Health and manager of the Pelvic Health Physical Therapy Program at UT Health Austin. Um, Uchenna completed her clinical doctorate in physical therapy at the University of Illinois at Chicago and completed her residency in women's health and movement impairment science at, the Was at Washington University in St. Louis. And I've had the honor of knowing um, Uchenna for, we met first of all at, um, when we were on a board together for the what was formerly the section on women's health. And just, I've had, it, it's just, you're going to be amazed by this talk. So I'm very excited to introduce Uchenna Osai. Thank you everyone for being here. It's uh, crazy that I'm speaking in a room without a mask on. After the last time I was here, we didn't have masks and it was just the beginning of COVID. But I'm very honored and excited to be speaking to you all about leadership and about the chronic pain of racism in leadership. Because I know when I was a student, we weren't talking about it in this context. A lot of us were taught to think of leadership as these seven pillars, you know, being a good person, consistency, all of those, all those words that we assign with, with being a good leader. But I want to challenge us a little bit today to shift that paradigm. So this is my sister and I, two chocolate drops in the early 80s, where we were, we were raised to be excellent. We were raised to be good people, all of those things, right? We, we were so little here, we didn't realize, oh, there's, there's a dual reality that we're born into. When we're thinking about the concept of pain, right? When we talk to our patients, we want to know what's going on. What was the initial injury? Was it genetics? Was it trauma? What was it? And when they're thinking about the concept of racism in this country, you know, what is that initial injury? Right, colonialism, right to perpetuate white supremacy, all those racist ideologies that are now hardwired and woven into the fabric of our system of society. So when we were little kids, we, we weren't quite aware of this yet, but I remember walking into my classroom in first grade and recognizing, oh, okay, okay, I have to work on navigating this world. I have to really understand how it works for them because I need to assimilate, I need to achieve higher in order to be a good leader. This is what it means, right? That, that one system that, system, that systemic oppression, the personally mediated oppression that internalized racism, all of that is done to maintain that initial injury, that initial myth of white supremacy. So this is me. I was 10 or 9, I, f I forget, my dad sent that to me a few days ago, and I was playing club soccer in Dallas, and I remember thinking, okay, it's on now, this is, this is how I'm going to be a good leader, right? I need to understand these systems. So this is what I understood at the age of 10. I knew that assimilation and mirroring, plus the avoidance of the archetypes that were attached to my race would give me that gold standard, that proximity to whiteness, which is what we use to define professionalism. And it wasn't just me, right? It was my classmates, right? Because they would say, oh, you see, you speak so white, you speak so proper, you do all this, all the mannerisms, right? How I did my hair, I used to straighten my hair. Obviously, I, did, I don't straighten it anymore. I cut it real short. You know, I used to kind of really monitor my being. And what happens when you're thinking about racism and the concept of racism is that you have one group that has to really think about suppressing themselves, their, their authenticity, right? Their goodness, right? What makes them authentically themselves because they know that in the, this society, it's not deemed as professional. It's not deemed as good leadership. It can be dangerous. It can be misinterpreted. It can be misunderstood. It can be micromanaged. And so this for me was what good leadership was. So when I grew up, I was still perpetuating that initial injury 
by my own behavior, but then my colleagues were doing the same thing from their own perspective. So when you're thinking about chronic pain, you know, what is that ongoing, unresolved issue of racism? What does that do? What is, that, what is the ongoing, unresolved issue of pain? You have that physiological response to stressors, right? Increased sensitivity. Well, here, like I said, we have that hardwired systemic sensitization, thinking that this is, this is what is the gold standard, right? We have that removal of the authentic self. For a lot of times, people of color have the positional power, but they're disempowered because they have to, again, abandon what is authentically themselves to kind of sit into this clear definition that doesn't necessarily take into account their, their full self, their full culture. And so then you have a system of survival versus thriving. And then you have a racially traumatized workforce on both ends. This one man wrote, I think about all the things that I've done and accomplished while living in survivor mode, and then I think about what I might be able to be doing living in a space of fullness and abundance. What about that loss of creativity? All that time of monitoring every behavior you have or understanding that what you're gonna be held accountable to a different standard. Oftentimes when I speak with leaders or when I'm consulting in, in you know, DEI projects, people say, no, everyone has the same accountability. Sure, on paper, but how about in our minds? Sarah, I'm gonna borrow you for a second. So if Sarah and I were in a professional setting and Sarah pops off and she's like, you know what you see? No, starts yelling, starts crying. How are you gonna perceive her? And what if I do the same thing? How are you gonna perceive me? Gut check yourself. Will you actually hold us both accountable truly? Or will that kind of perpetuate some of that deep-rooted stereotypes that we all internalize? Because remember, I'm blackity black, and I still internalized all of those things. And I thought that is what good leadership was. And as a leader, it actually minimized my effectiveness to bond and connect with people reporting to me, to my students, all of that. So I love this quote by Salwa Rahim Dillard. She wrote in the Harvard Business Review last year. She said, many mid and senior level BIPOC leaders struggle to gain contextual understanding of themselves in America's workplaces. Along with feelings of disengagement and exclusion, they face tensions where their values are in conflict with their perceptions of, the lead of their leaders' expectations. Unlike simply code switching, Tactics of adjusting vernacular to blend in, in during interracial exchanges, mirroring is more pervasive strategy that sometimes requires the abandonment of core values. Yeesh. So this ongoing unresolved racism also leads to white leaders having a decreased ability to bridge and having inequitable accountability, which degrades trust degrades productivity, degrades clinical and complex thinking, and keeps people in that survival mode. And BIPOC leaders, it decreases their ability to bond. And that means that if we don't, if we don't address these issues, if we don't address the issues of this inequitable accountability, this decreased ability to bond, this decreased ability to bridge, then this inclusive workspace is nonsense. It's, it's just a fantasy. It's not a reality. I can't tell you how many times people hire DEI officers for their teams, but the culture has not even been changed. How are you going to hire a whole person to do DEI work when you haven't changed your culture? When you haven't changed your mindset? When you haven't created a strategic plan that actually is in fitting with your personal values and what you know needs to happen to elevate everyone on the team. Another thing that's a shame about racism and leadership is that what we forget is that you have this whole group of marginalized people who've developed this significant amount of community cultural wealth. 
that navigational capital, so being able to navigate a system that is specifically designed to oppress you and still succeed, and people aren't tapping into that juicy goodness? Really? How about the resistance capital? Being able to, to manage and navigate corporate world, academic world, again, with that same mindset. Linguistic capital, all of these things actually are very, very great building blocks for excellent leadership, for innovation, right? For everyone to be elevated. This is why diverse workspaces are important. But not just having diversity, diversity is not just enough. You have to have a culture where that diversity can grow and thrive. You have to nurture that soil. So at the end of the day, we have a system that's lit up, right? We're primed to maintain this cycle. And then you have, again, that traumatized workforce where everyone's in that hamster wheel where nothing, we're not really moving forward. I was talking to my colleague the other day and she asked me, do you think things have changed? How, you know, how much have things changed for you since 2020? And I said, uh, I, I get more consulting gigs. <laughs> so that's been nice. But it hasn't, it hasn't changed for me in my workspace. It hasn't changed for a lot of my, my, call, my BIPOC colleagues and friends and family members. Just kind of business as usual, except they have more DEI training sessions quarterly. Right? So how do we treat this? Right? Because everyone says, but I already took my DEI training. I already did this. How do we treat this? How do we address this? The way we address this is we actually reframe that question. So we say, what kind of leader allyship is required in order to combat and then to transform systems that distribute white advantages while simultaneously delivering disadvantages for people of color and has positioned these as perfectly acceptable outcomes for centuries? We have to ask ourselves, what is a perfectly acceptable, acceptable outcome in our workspace, in our learning space? What is acceptable? Right? When they talk about distinctive traits of inclusive leaders, you know, these are the six. I'm not going to read them all out to you. But these top two are essential. Right? Having that visible commitment, that humility means, number one, you're going to consistently challenge the status quo. You're going to hold people accountable. You're going to admit when you make mistakes and understand that your behaviors do have, ne have negative impacts on your BIPOC colleagues, students, patients, friends, but that you have to continue increasing your skill set. You have to con continue increasing your, your ability to learn and upskill because that's going to benefit society as a whole. And of course, we all know awareness of bias, but awareness of bias isn't enough. It has to work in tandem with all of these, having that curiosity of others, having that cultural intelligence and effective collaboration. But in order to do these, you have to have this. You have to have the visible commitment. You have to have that humility. So you need to understand your leadership's shadow. And what is your ability level when it comes to inclusion? Is it low? Is it medium? Is it high? What is your impact? What is your impact on all of your colleagues, all of your patients, all of your students? So here, they have this great table where they're talking about how do you measure your ability, right? So if you're looking at the behavior of empowering voice and decision making, Someone who has a low ability articulates opinions before allowing a BIPOC person to speak, heeds only the viewpoints of senior leaders, instructs BIPOCs on how to lead, appraise, and promote their team members based on their valuation. Whereas someone who has an average ability is going to allow BIPOC individuals to make decisions only when stakes are low, seeks advice when facing crisis from people with marginalized communities. This happened to me. All that well, happens all the time. So the intention is there, right? They're trying, but
but I'm only sought out in those crisis moments. And then high ability is going to encourage a BIPOC person to lead and appraise their team with autonomy. Going to amplify their voices and decisions and anticipate disagreements and resolve them with equi equitably. And that's key. Having the skill to resolve disagreements and conflicts with equity. That is a true skill, a practice skill. Behavior of taking risks and pushing through fear with courageous actions. Right? This requires humility. This requires a visibility. This requires awareness of bias. And when you're thinking about here, the key piece is, is remaining silent, afraid, and excessively consumed with a personal risk when, risk when witnessing injustice, exclusion, or inequity. I see this a lot. This doesn't make someone a bad person. This doesn't, make, <laughs> this doesn't make them inherently problematic as a whole, but when you think about the, oops, just lost my earring. But when you think about the concept of leadership, it can be incredibly problematic because this creates an unsafe environment for your BIPOC colleagues. Speaking truth to power, right? Again, that's going to be someone with a higher ability so they can take those principles of inclusive leaders and really run with it. So if you're a person with high skill, keep, keep going. It never, it's never going to stop. You have to keep pushing. If you're a person with medium skill, you're going to have to acknowledge that you have inevitable impact of behavior on BIPOC people. And you have a higher level, and you have to increase your level of competence. And for someone on the low scale, it's okay, we gotta start somewhere. We have to have that self-reflection on how that negative impact of your behavior, what does that mean? What does that look like? That requires getting feedback from your colleagues, from those report to you, from your students, and then also increasing that basic skill level. So for me, when asked, what is an inclusive leader? What's an excellent leader? You have to be brave enough to publicly challenge the status quo at all levels, systemic, personal, internalized, every single day, forever. Thank you. So now we are going to break out yeah, into groups. We're gonna, we're gonna break out into groups and we're gonna post the question. All right, we're gonna come back together as a group. I'll give you all a few moments to to come together so we can talk about your brainstorm. So how was this exercise for all of you? Yeah, was it eye-opening? Was it helpful to collaborate? Was it frustrating? Sarah has the mic. I think sometimes when we look at, and I chose two years as a marker, mainly because in 2020 is when we were all forced to start rethinking how we do things, correct? And a lot of us have consumed a ton of DEI stuff. We've read books, we've watched movies, we've checked all the articles, done the TED Talks, so I was just curious, what has, this, has it changed for you all? And the common theme that I saw in the brainstorm is that you had this improved awareness, just in general, which is great. And for some of you, there was a, there was a lot of action-oriented stuff. And for others, I still think there's a contemplative phase. But Sarah has the mic, so does anyone want to share anything personal or particular for their group?
Okay, um, we had a group that had mostly students in it, except for Deborah and I, who are students of life. Um, so identifying like the fragile area is that they have preset surveys but the, for like end of term, but they don't have any questions pertaining to any of this on it. And while they're anonymous and there is a, a free space to write, it doesn't really set an expectation. Um, but in the good news portion is they're saying that a lot of the teachers are reaching out and really trying to make sure that the environment is safe for the students. But we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a question, questions that lead towards an expectation of open communication and equity and safety onto the end of term surveys and also in the CPI so that clinical sites are being held accountable and have an expectation of this. I have no that, idea how to change that, but if we could make that happen, it'd be cool. Oh, if I could make that happen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing if with If we you. could make that happen. There are some <laughs> educators in the room, though, so we could yes. tell them that. But I, I would like to comment on that. That's a specific systemic change. That's looking at policy. That's looking at how we're measuring effectiveness, how we're measuring safety, how we're, and it also challenges our leaders and decision makers and thought leaders to change, to create a space of soft landing for everyone so that people don't have that added stress of having to kind of de having to develop that navigational capital. Right? Or maybe we all get that navigational capital and we all elevate it from that. So I love that idea. I love that idea. Round of applause. I think there was a hand raised up somewhere. Another group? Yep. Um, we are a pretty mixed group of PT, PT students and massage therapists, and one of the things that was getting really interesting, just as you called time, were um, word usage and how words that some people, you know, because of cultural backgrounds or experiences may find triggering. Like, for example, we were talking about the use of treatment table versus treatment bed, or we were talking about how even the word relax in a, from a trauma-informed perspective can be triggering for someone who was being assaulted and the assaulter was constantly saying, relax. And so how to navigate that and how to you know, create that safe uh, experience and interaction. It was, it was really actually very enlightening. So thanks for that. Absolutely. I think the choice of language, as you're right, is very important. It's, it's speaking to that uh, cultural community wealth, right? Where having that linguistic capital and navigating different cultures and, of, of course, different experiences. So then you can say, you can kind of lean on your colleagues, students to say, oh, okay, please check me on this, right? Please educate me. Because I know that even though people, there was a big push, I think, especially during George Floyd, where people say, don't, don't make black people be, <laughs> be your, your teacher. But the thing is, that is the burden, right? But we also have to be in a space to not just receive. Because I think a lot of us spend a lot of time collecting information, and we need to actually move forth in action, right? It's the action-oriented approach that we have to start taking in order to really move the needle on this. Because we can't claim to have inclusive environments if we're still having students feeling like they can't be their true selves, our patients, our colleagues. There is a specific reason why marginalized groups with terminal degrees do not have the same health status as a white person who doesn't have a high school diploma, particularly black women. And so we really want to make sure we can close the gap, and that gap, it's going to, and we're part of that problem. It's not just minimizing our fried chicken, grape drink, all of that. It's about creating spaces where everyone feels safe so that they don't have to deal with that internal physiological response to racism and stress and all of, all, everything in between. Yeah, thank you. So interesting thing in our group, I currently am living in Boise, Idaho, and just so happened to meet Taryn, who went to Boise State <laughs> for a few years. And, um, Taryn is, can I refer to you as being? 
biracial. Is that fair? So Taryn shared that he's biracial, and then also Jocelyn in our group shared that she is of an indigenous people background. And here I am, totally, I mean, I just own it, right? Caucasian, very privileged. And just talking about in where I am right now, I've lived in multiple states. Idaho's the sixth state I've lived in. I've lived in much more racially populous areas like Milwaukee, went to college in Milwaukee, and realizing that I desperately want to check these biases to strive for all these ideals, and I'm in a workplace that is complete, I don't have almost anyone of color at all to, to have access to. And so recognizing that and trying to just strive for, you know, it's not even anything that's on our radar, unfortunately, and this was making me really realize that. And then hearing um, Jocelyn and, and Taryn's own experiences, the fact also to the dynamic they shared personally is that at face value they don't present. And that was something that we really talked about. And, and almost feeling like sometimes it's an advantage, but then I said in my heart, and I don't understand it as well, that almost was hard for me to hear. I wouldn't want that to be that way. So those were some of the topics that we talked about. I think you hit the nail on the head on an issue when you're saying you're in a predominantly white space and you're like, we don't have you know, colleagues of color to kind of draw from. But that's, I think that's the key of inclusive leadership is to have these conversations no matter, you know, who, no matter who's in the room. That's, that's part of the learning. Even if it's all white people, even if it's all black people, even if it's all indigenous people, we have to have these conversations about race, about that initial insult. How do we minimize that perpetuating injury? So it's actually, you have this beautiful opportunity to be like, look, let's have a round table. Let's talk about this. Like, let's make this part of our staff meeting every once in a while. Let's create a culture where we can openly discuss these concerns. And even though you may not have someone who can testify to say, this is my experience, but you can still be introspective and think about the impact of you being silent, right? You participating. How are you participating in perpetuating that in initial insult? with the systemic oppression, with the personally mediated stuff, and also the things that you internalize, right? Because we all do it. Um, yes, but think about queer people, uh, whether you're talking about professional colleagues or clients or patients, as a mixed indigenous queer person, we are wherever you are, <laughs> anywhere in this country, I promise you. So actually, I'll, I'll wait for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So second part to that, sorry, that was really loud. Um, so that's the interesting dynamic is I don't have accessibility or, or not around persons of color as much, but I have several colleagues that are out and very supported and several clients as well. So that's really interesting to have that. So here's this one group that unfortunately has been more traditionally segregated that has found in our culture where we are, that doesn't seem to be the issue. It's just the other, other areas. So yeah, absolutely. Anyone else want to share what their team noticed over the past two years? I'm going to check the online crew yep. real quick. No. I'm not seeing it. I might take a minute to load up. Okay. Anyone else in the room want to share thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as a student, as many of us are students, um, it's interesting coming into this graduate level community of people who have sort of made an effort in their life to be a healthcare provider who is, you know, em empathetic, passionate, and caring for people. And we've, I, th I feel like meeting so many of these students who are, have had amazing backgrounds and are just so, you know, open and wanting to connect with everybody that this healthcare community, I think naturally, at least in this area, where it's diverse, um, it, it, it's, it just seems like there are natural ways of um, becoming more, uh, what's the word? 
like, well, okay, sorry. Now everyone's turning and looking at me, and I'm kind of like, <laughs> oh shoot, now I'm talking to an audience. You're doing uh, good. You're doing. <laughs> yeah. You're doing good. Like, doing uh, good. basically, what I'm trying to say is that, <laughs> yeah, everybody turn around. If you can just turn around for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, uh, it seems like people in this area in San Diego are more exposed to a more diverse population. So we kind of have our own innate ways of becoming more inclusive and developing our own mental, personal strategies for addressing these issues, especially for this uh, healthcare community. And so it's one thing to have had those uh, personal, uh, you know, individualized ways of dealing with you know, these issues, but it's another, it's another thing to take it to the next level and be aware of people who are not conscious of this and take it to that, you know, empowerment and educated, uh, educative level, level of, you know, kind of like, you know, strategizing how to minimize the, the injury that, that we've been talking about. So I don't know. It, it just seems like we are doing a great job of, you know, being open, but now we got to be more um, actionable, which is what you're talking about. So I don't know. Something else I want to talk, talk about. <laughs> no, I, I think that Great that's, I, no, I, I love what you said because you're absolutely right. I think that you, you're saying that you all have gone through that contemplative phase where you're open and you're willing and you're, you're like, okay, we, we, we now know. We know what the research says. <laughs> we know what we got to do. We've, we've done that, that level of work. And now it's about, okay, so how do I actually, like, how do I actually do this in a real sustaining way that has impact, right? That, that actually makes a difference. So one of the things is that I always tell people to think about is conflict management, right? So if there's a conflict, how is that managed? Examine how that managed. What are the policies? Is it transparent? Right? Our promotion, is promotion transparent? Is that process pretty linear, right? Pretty clear? How, in t and when I talked about that concept of accountability, right? I, I will give you an example. So when I was, uh, a few years ago, I spoke to one of my supervisors and I said, let's, let's, let's call this person Amy Cooper. And I said, Amy Cooper cries a lot in meetings when I propose an opposing issue and it shuts down the meeting and it makes it really difficult for us to move forward. And, but then whenever, but it never happens when my other colleague does it, who's white, right? And every time I would talk about it, my, my supervisor would say, well, you know, they're just really passionate, right? They really care and that's why, you know, they're just really sensitive. Same thing would happen if they yelled. And so that manager went through training and they came to me a few years later saying, I didn't realize how dismissive and minimizing your experience that was for me to do that to you. I'm so sorry. And that, I didn't even realize that I, I mean, because I'm just used to, to that. But man, to have that acknowledgement, I was like, oh, I'm going to stay an hour later for work today. Right? Like, I'm going to do these charts at work, not at home. <laughs> right? But it, I think that when we think about those little things and how they really do add up, those, that, that micro, those microaggressions kind of minimize my, my bandwidth. Right? It minimizes the bandwidth for everyone. So. OK. So we, have, we do have one online um, comment from Jamie Lowy. Um, he says that I've carried the discomfort from, um, from your last summit talk as the energy I need needed to continue the conversation in my workspaces. That's fantastic. That is really great. I, you know, I think the discomfort is something that we all should share. It's not a solo burden, right? It's a collective burden. All right, and then we also have a, a question from Sheila, I believe online, I don't know. Oh, she's here, excellent. Um, so she asks, how do you, do you wanna ask? Since you're in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Seems silly for me to <laughs> read it for you. My question was for like, for the end, but yeah. Oh, we're almost the end Yeah, we have about so, four minutes okay, left. Okay, so can I like spend maybe 30 seconds on, so I just wanted to say with my group, I feel like I appreciate that we're, kind of in different stages, but everybody was willing to be honest. 
And so I'm an OT. We're 84% white um, in our profession. And so I'm South Asian, so I'm a racialized person. I have brown skin, but I also recognize the privilege that I have. And so I'd say over the past two years, I was doing a lot of um, kind of <laughs> educating all my white peers and being that token person because I felt like I have privilege. I can take on more of a burden. And it was, <laughs> it was totally burning me out. And it was pissing me off and it was super frustrating and nothing was happening. I was doing all this work for free. And so what I've done more recently is I'm trying to center my BIPOC peers, creating like healing spaces, creating groups for practitioners, creating opportunities for BIPOC students. And so my question was really kind of based on like, how do you navigate being asked? Like you're, you're given breadcrumbs. Like if you consult, you can charge a certain amount, but people don't really want to pay. They don't want to, um, they don't want to take on like that systemic policy procedure work. Most people just kind of want to reflect. They want you to do a lecture. So, you know, to me, it feels like the decision is, okay, either I, <coughs> I know I'm feeling pressure. I feel like I don't know really get nervous. But, um, <laughs> thanks. But because um, to me, it's like, it's, it's personal. So, you know, when you're racialized, you already have this, like, I already understand I'm not <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, I'm kind of at that point, like, let's do stuff. Like, let's take action. I don't understand what's taking so long. And some people are just at the point of, I didn't even see what was going on. It's like, I didn't have a choice, right? I know I have privilege, but some of us didn't even have a choice. We're already living that life. So, like, do you take those breadcrumbs? Because you're like, well, otherwise they're not going to do anything, or they're going to fill it with, like, something you know, somebody else who's willing to do it for free or somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about is going to fill that space? Or do you suck it up and just know, okay, I'm just going to plant the seeds knowing that this probably isn't going to be long term. They're not invested. They're not sharing power. They just, you know, like, how do you navigate that? I know they're not invested, but they're asking me to do something. Do I do it or do I not do it? So that is the best, like, one of the best questions I've heard in a long time because it's something that I have struggled with myself. And I think that it's, I think this is a great question for everyone in the room to hear. So here's my answer to you. Do you. You need to protect yourself, right? So if you decide, I spent, I, I'm going to spend this, I spent two years doing the breadcrumb work. I spent the past two years growing myself. I spent the past two years in turn doing all the things that I talked about. Your price went up. Your price went up. You're like, if you want me to invest and give this part of myself, then you're going to pay me appropriately for that, for my time, for my expertise, for the work that I'm doing that you benefit from. And then you, you know, and then you have discovery calls with people. If you're like, oh, you just want a lecture, I have a great colleague that can do that for you. You know, I, I send them, I'll send them your way. Right? But oh, you actually want to do the work? I'm down for that because that's where I want to put my energy. I want to put my energy into helping you change your culture and that's my skill set. I, but these other people are great at doing the kind of touch point thing, the HR thing that you need. Right? But where is your skill set? Where do you want to see yourself grow and where do you, where do you want to put your gifts at? And that's where you, you center yourself because what you're willing to do now is it may not be what you're willing to do in two years. Any okay. other questions? Yeah, so we have one more online that I think would actually be a beautiful way to yeah. wrap up um, from Karen Litzy. Um, so, sorry, more comments came in and I lost her. Okay. So how is making a difference measured in real world situations or should it say how can we measure making a difference? Yeah, so I think measuring making a difference is to look at your, like I always say, doing a, an assessment like quarterly with yourself and say, what, what is happening with my environment? Let me talk to my colleagues. Let me talk to my students, wherever that space is, and saying, what do we need to improve on here? What is your experience? OK, here are the things that we're going to do. And then we're going to check it. Like right now in our department, we have a dashboard. We have goals, right, equity goals. And we're going to check in with each other. So then we know, OK, here are the things that we've objectively done to move action forward. But has that translated to building trust? Has that translated to people feeling like there's equ equitable accountability? Has that translated to people feeling less oppressed, less stressed? Has that increased their bandwidth to participate in this space? 
And I think it's also about knowing that you're never going, it's never, the job is never done. So that's another thing. There's always more to do. Like I said, it's, 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 <laughs> this is a lifelong thing. And we just have to elevate ourselves every day so that we minimize the impact of systemic oppression. That's our job as leaders. I feel like I should give this to you so you can drop it. But, <laughs> but I think the, the sound guys probably wouldn't like it very much. Um, so everyone, let's just thank, uh, thank you, Chenna, for a great talk. All right. And